The following program was funded by the Bear Terrier Terrebonne National Estuary Program, the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality, the Environmental Protection Agency, and Nichols State University. believe what I just saw underwater. Gulf Island, Louisiana. I believe you, Chuck. Right below my pillow used to be land. Just 30 years ago, people used to go fishing right over there, and they didn't even need a boat. Well, if Louisiana keeps losing wetlands at the rate it's going, a lot more people are going to need boats. Or scuba gear. This map represents the area of Louisiana called the Barataria Terrebonne Estuary. Whatever that means. An estuary is a place where saltwater and freshwater meet. It's a place where many forms of life flourish, including people and the things they eat. Our estuary is the largest coastal wetlands area in the United States, but it used to be a whole lot larger. According to experts, the Barataria Terrebonne Estuary has lost about a half a million acres in the past six decades. That's a football field lost every 90 minutes of every day of every year since 1932. This is where the coastline used to be. According to computer models, it could look like this in less than a hundred years. So, you could be standing in waist deep water where communities like these now sit, unless something is done about it. People have been trying to do something about it for years through a joint federal and state project called the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program, or the BTNEP. One of these scientists is Steve Matisse, director of the estuary program. What's unique about our program is the way that we've made decisions and that uh, the decisions that we make are based on consensus. And they're not consensus of just government officials, but it's consensus of the people who live and work in the estuary. Um, and so our main mission has been to develop a long-term management plan, uh, and that plan has been developed and written by those, by those volunteers, by the people who live here. Our most serious, our most immediate problem in coastal Louisiana uh, has to do with our land loss rates. We have a lot of other problems, but uh, the most important of those problems would be land loss. Well, now I'm wondering why all this is happening to our estuary. That's what the scientists wanted to know when the estuary program research began. What they found out was that there were a number of problems facing our wetlands, seven to be precise. Habitat loss, changes in living resources, eutrophication, pathogen contamination, toxic substances, sediment loss, and the most significant one, hydrologic modification, which really began about 70 years ago. No, wait, wait, wait. Hydroloptic, her herbalactical... <laughs> it's hydrologic I, I... modification. You try it. Hydro. Hydro. Logic. Logic. Modification. modification. Okay, I can pronounce it, but what is it? 
In our case, hydrologic modification refers to man-made changes in the flow of natural bodies of water. And to understand it, you have to understand how South Louisiana was formed by the Mississippi River dumping silt into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, to understand that, I guess we'll have to go to the laboratory. Imagine, this is the Gulf of Mexico, and this is the Mississippi River. The running water comes from 41% of the continental United States. That's 32 of the United States, as well as a couple of provinces way up in Canada. Of course, there weren't any provinces or states yet. In fact, there weren't even any people living here yet. One thing I'm sure there was plenty of was mud. Mud, mud, mud. mud. This mud, or silt, collected over the years forming the delta. A delta is a piece of land near the mouth of a river that's formed by the river depositing silt there. This process was underway for thousands of years. We don't have that kind of time. So, for the magic of time-lapse photography, we'll speed things up a bit. See? The silt collected, forming South Louisiana. I live right about... Of course, the process is a lot more complicated than this. The river has changed courses several times over the last few millennia. About 9,000 years ago, the river ran toward an area we now call Morgan City, and it deposited a huge amount of silt on the Gulf Coast, forming the first delta. Then, to everyone's surprise, the river shifted its course like this and created another delta. Then it surprised everyone again when it shifted like this. Before long, in geological terms, like about a thousand years, it shifted again, depositing still more silt. And again, and to almost no one's surprise, it shifted again, about a thousand years ago, to its present course. And today it wants to shift again, down the Atchafalaya River. Shift, shift, cha 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 shift, shift. The river continued to dump silt into the gulf, building up the land this way. Each spring, the river also flooded, building up the land this way. While this flooding was good for the land, it sometimes caused trouble for the people living there. After the flood of 1927 killed a lot of people living in South Louisiana, the federal government decided to do something to control the river. This hill we're on is actually a man-made levee built along the banks of the Mississippi River to protect the people living here in Donaldsonville from floods. It also serves to dam up Bayou Lafouche from the Mississippi River. This set of big pipes running through the levee is called a siphon. It controls the amount of water flowing from the river into the bayou to protect the people living down the bayou from floods as well. Bayou Lafouche used to be the main channel of the river during the third and fifth cha-chas, I mean, <coughs> third and fifth deltas. After the river changed courses to the sixth and seventh deltas, Bayou Lafouche became a major distributary of river water, even though it was no longer the main channel anymore. Great. The levees controlled the river. Flooding almost never happened. People were happy. <laughs> Children were safe. Lions laid down with the lambs. Until someone noticed Louisiana was shrinking. <laughs> Esme doesn't let me play with the high-tech special effects anymore. Here's what happened. Building the levees and dams control the river. This prevents flooding. However, very little water and sediment was flowing into the river's minor distributaries, like Bayou Lafouche. Almost all the water was restricted to the main channel. As you can see, this allows only a small fraction of the water that nature intended to actually go down the bayou. For example, the amount of water and sediment flowing into Bayou Lafouche was reduced by over 90%. This resulted in sediment loss. Most of that rich sediment was simply washing into the Gulf. Why is this a problem? Allow me to explain. 
Scientists tell us that the biggest problem, though not the only problem, leading to land loss in southern Louisiana is subsidence. Here's how it works. Imagine that the Mississippi River and its distributaries are not carrying sediment, but potato chips. Potato chips. Yes, I said. When the chips first get deposited, they take up lots and lots of room. But as the label warns, some, some settling, settling of contents, contents normally occurs. occurs. They settle and become more compact and 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 more compact. Thank you. And without the water carrying more chips or mud, the land can actually sink. So subsidence is basically gravity pressing the wetlands down until they're underwater. However, something can be done about it. Hey, what you're looking at below me is a cement gate, which is part of this biolomoke diversion structure, which allows fresh water to pass through the gate underneath the culvert and through the levee and into the lower marsh in the Brenton Sound Basin. Now, these structures behind me are the actual gear cases and stems, which actually raise and lower the gate, which allows us to determine just how much water we want to flow into the lower estuary. Okay, we're now on the other side of the levee where the water actually enters the marsh. Now this particular structure was built in 1955. So as you can see, that even 40 years ago, people knew the benefits of freshwater diversion. If you had a jar and you put some dirt in the bottom, and you added some water to that jar, as long as you, are, you have the water in motion, the sediments stay in suspension. As soon as you put the jar on the table, though, the sediments drop out. That's the same thing that happens whenever you try to move dirt from the river to where you need it in the marsh. Now, you might be solving or helping to solve our land loss problem by adding those sediments, but also you're creating another problem. You're creating a problem with, for the people that actually live there. When you add that water, you're increasing the likelihood of flooding their communities. So, one of the key solutions to the sediment loss problem plaguing the Bear Terrier Terrebonne Estuary is to redirect more Mississippi River water into the wetlands the way nature intended. But it's not that simple. As we heard, if you flood the land, you flood the people living on the land as well, unless you take additional steps to protect them. So it seems pretty clear that there are some major man-made hydrological modifications within the South Louisiana wetlands, like the Mississippi River. It used to flood each spring and deposit silt, but now because it's straightjacketed within the levee system, it no longer deposits that silt into our wetlands. Instead, it deposits that silt into the deep gulf waters off the continental shelf, where it will never build up land. And our wetlands are slowly sinking due to gravity and being pressed underwater by the natural process called subsidence. <laughs> Remember? But why do we care? The levees keep the cities and towns in South Louisiana from flooding. Don't forget about the Great Flood of 1927. So what if the wetlands are slowly sinking? It doesn't sound like much of a problem to me. Oh, but it's a big problem. Plants that are used to growing on dry land, except for an occasional flood, now have to get used to growing underwater all year round. Without the muddy floodwaters coming up and building up the land, the plants and animals are finding themselves running out of dry land. Or running out of wetlands. Let's see what the experts have to say. With this lack of sediment coming into the marshes, subsidence becomes a big problem. When a land sinks, it exposes more and more of the vegetation that's holding the marsh together to salt and brackish water. This water eventually kills the marsh vegetation, which is holding the land together, and it makes it uh, more susceptible to tides and, and wave action. And in a matter of a few years, you can have a substantial amount of marsh lost this way. You think this lab coat makes me look fat? What we have here is an environmental domino effect, where one change leads to a whole string of changes. It begins when the river stops flooding and stops depositing silt, and the land subsides due to gravity. Ah, yes. Soon the subsiding land is completely underwater, and the land plants basically drown. And the animals who live in those wetlands have to move further inland to find habitats. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. 
and the soil being held into place by those drowned plants can be more easily washed away by stormy weather and tidal action. Eventually, we lose massive amounts of wetland habitat due to this chain reaction. As we said, beginning in 1932, we've lost a football field's worth of wetlands every 90 minutes, largely due to this process. Chuck, no! Habitat loss also occurs through another hydrological modification that people have made while trying to find gas and oil. Lots of waterways have been cut through the marshes to make it easier to get boats and barges to the oil fields. Some are large, like this canal. Some are small, like these trinasses. Some of these man-made waterways are straight lines cut from the salty Gulf of Mexico toward the freshwater marshes and swamps. When they're first built, they allow a lot of salt water to enter the freshwater areas, which spells trouble for the freshwater habitats. Remember the domino effect we just showed you where a chain of events led from sediment loss to habitat loss? Well, what I'm about to show you is the environmental domino effect caused by saltwater intrusion through man-made channels. <coughs> this type of hydrological modification can cause big problems for the plants and animals. When salty gulf water flows very quickly and directly through man-made waterways and reaches places that are supposed to be freshwater, the plant life dies. And erosion can occur because there are no longer plant roots to hold the soil in place. Saltwater intrusion sets up a chain reaction of other problems. Normally what happens when you build these navigation channels is that you'll get a saltwater wedge moving up into the freshwater marshes and freshwater swamps. But what happens whenever the succession changes from a fresh dominated system to a salt dominated system is the critters that lived in the fresh dominated system, the migratory birds, raccoons and other animals, have to then move farther north uh, to meet their habitat requirements. When we think about habitats and habitat loss, we usually think about cute little furry animals and cute little furry fish. But fish aren't furry. Shh, I'm on a roll. Cute little furry fish. But there's another animal whose habitat is also being lost. Cute little furry people. People are not furry. You've never seen my brother-in-law, Clem. <clears throat> anyway, there are thousands of people making their habitats in coastal Louisiana. Experts say that in the next 15 years, over 160,000 160, 160, 160, acres of wetlands may be lost. And some of those acres have people living on them right now. These communities are at risk. This is not a new phenomenon. If we look at coastal Louisiana, and we look at it from a period of the last 100 years, we'll find that communities in the greater Barataria region, such as Manila Village, are no longer with us. The only thing left in many ways are isolated cemeteries. If we don't make some important decisions on how we're going to protect this area, then the population as we know it is going to be greatly changed when the year 2040 census comes along, because by then, what we know as land may in fact be water. The salt water is just taking over everything. You can get fish, but no grain of oil. You can't raise nothing no more. What the happened? garden, you, you can't raise that either. The, too far gone, the, 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 the salt water took over all that. The oak tree, they're growing, but they, they're sick. You can see they're sick, they're dying. Well, I'm 70 years old. I ain't worried about my life too much no more, but the one that's 10, 12 years old now, that's the one, you know, you gotta look for. It's not just a matter, and it's an important matter of saving the estuaries, but if the land goes, if the estuaries go, our whole culture goes, our heritage, all that we are as a people would go. You know, South Louisiana is really a a beautiful place with our bayous and our swamps, but it's not like it used to be. My grandfather had his farm out here, and it's fast went away from soil subsidence and industry moving in with their canals. Just think in a few years, this might all be beachfront property. Another important issue related to habitat loss is a key issue called changes in living resources. 
When we change the plant and animal life in any wetland area, we lose incredibly rich bird sanctuaries as well as other sources. For example, if we lose marshland where alligators and minks make their home, then that land loses its ability to produce more alligators and minks. So we lose a lot of valuable meat, hide, and fur. And when the water becomes too salty, we lose places where baby shrimp, baby crabs, and oysters can live and grow. And we lose places where sports fish, like redfish and speckled trout, can feed on those young shrimp, crab, and oysters. So guess what? We lose a lot of valuable food sources as well, which is a tragic loss to Louisiana because seafood is such an important part of our culture. Well, I think there can be absolutely no debate about it. Seafood is the actual foundation for Louisiana's cuisine. And there's a reason for it. Over the last 200 years, we've had such an abundance of all of the wonderful seafoods from the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River, the swamp lands, of course, our great lakes all over Louisiana. And can you imagine for a minute a Louisiana meal without crawfish, crab, shrimp, oysters, a little trout, flounder? I tell you one thing, you couldn't call it Cajun and Creole. And it's a major economic loss since we harvest more seafood than any other state. Except Alaska. But who wants to go ice fishing anyway? The Louisiana Cooperative Extension Service reports that in 1995 alone, the seafood harvest brought in more than $860 million to our state. The shrimp industry is gone right now. It's, it's not like it used to be at all. The crabs are not there, the shrimp is not there, the fish is not there. It's, it's, I don't know what really happened, but it, it's, it's gone. They got, somebody got to do something about it. You know, it's, I don't know what they can do about it, but something got to be done. Diverting water, fresh water from the Mississippi River through the Canavan Diversion Project We've been able to partially control the salinities on the public oyster grounds, which we believe has had a positive impact on the oyster production in the area. But losing these living resources is more than just a loss for Louisiana. It's a loss for the country, since one-fifth of all seafood harvested in the United States spends all or part of its life in the waters of the Barataria Terrebonne Estuary. So, it's the whole country's problem. There's still more ways we can do damage to the living resources in the waters of the Barataria Terrebonne Estuary, especially to the fish and shellfish. And believe it or not, one of these ways can stop miles from the coast in the middle of the city at sewage treatment plants like this one. Or at fishing camps like mine. Or in agricultural fields like this one. In fertilized suburban lawns like this one. It's a process called eutrophication. There it is, right above your head. It's not so hard. You try it. Eutrophication. 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 It's all about balance. Between every species in the estuary, there is a delicate balance. Algae, fish, shellfish, and even things too small to mention all depend on that balance. But sometimes people throw off that delicate Life depends on a number of cycles to stay in balance. For instance, tiny water plants like this green slimy stuff that grows on the inside of Chuck's fishbowl here, called algae, breathes in carbon dioxide and breathes out oxygen into the water. The animals in the water, like Chuck's fish here named... Uh, jaws. Jaws, breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Then the cycle starts all over again, but sometimes something goes wrong. Okay, there's several different things that can throw an estuary's ecosystem out of... Uh-uh, I ain't doing that again balance. Uh, one of those would be the addition of additional nutrients and those are byproducts of, of other of our activities. For instance, they can come from the sewage treatment plants or they might come from uh, runoff from our lawns or our fields. Uh, whenever those nutrients are added to the water column, the plants that live there, the algae that live there are over uh, like fertilized, and so they're going to grow a lot quicker than they normally would. That would result in algae, what we call algae blooms. Here's what eutrophication looks like. The plants and animals are all living in a delicate balance, and as extra nutrients come in, Chuck, as I was saying, as the extra nutrients from human waste, animal waste, agricultural fertilizer, lawn fertilizers, and other sources enter the water, they fertilize the algae. 
In fact, they cause a bumper crop of algae called an algae balloon. After a few days, the algae begins to die. There's a type of bacteria in the water whose job it is to eat the dead algae. And these bacteria also use up some of the oxygen. This isn't a problem normally, but when we have a lot of extra algae, we have a lot of dead algae. And so we get a bumper crop of bacteria, too. After an algae bloom, there are so many bacteria feeding on the dead algae that they use up all the oxygen in the water, causing what we call a fish kill. That's when the fish die, in this case from lack of oxygen. Just like Jaws' brother Moby did. That's because you didn't clean out the fish tank when I told you to. Oh, oh, well thank you for bringing up that painful memory. Why don't you uh, just tell everybody about the time I got lost in the grocery store? Unlike the fishbowl, the estuary is very large. Largest coastal wetlands area in the United States. I already did that part. Oh. <clears throat> the estuary is very large. So eutrophication doesn't happen to the whole estuary all at once. There are people at work identifying the places that have this problem. One of the things that the Department of Environmental Quality does is uh, monitor the water quality in the lakes and rivers throughout the state. What I'm in the process of doing is uh, collecting some water quality data at this, this station. This meter is a hydro lab. What uh, this particular meter does is uh, monitor uh, some of the fuel parameters. What we're looking at in particular here are salinity readings, dissolved oxygen, also water temperature, depth, and uh, addition we use a uh, wastewater sampler. This device we lower it down to a designated uh, depth in the water column to uh, collect a sample. Some things that we look for in particular are metals, uh, total organic carbon, chemical oxygen demand, nitrogen, alkalinity. What we're looking for is long-term trends or changes in uh, and water quality at a lot of the different stations. While some people are studying the problems, there are others who are offering solutions. Uh, one technique to uh, combat the, these excessive nutrients entering our streams is to maintain a strip of, uh, of growth of uh, vegetation, grasses, whatever. And uh, these strips serve to uh, filter out the uh, sediments and uh, we'll actually use some of the nutrients uh, uh, before they discharge into uh, the stream. Farmers are very cost conscious, they're also very environmentally conscious. They don't want that to buy more fertilizer than they have to, and they don't want what they put out there to run off into the, to the streams and bios and, and uh, swamps to cause environmental problems there. They're, they're community residents as well. So what they do is they use the, the fertilizer and uh, the application methods that best fit those variables at the time. One method is a process called knifing, where they go in with a, a deep shank and they open the soil, put the fertilizer into that ripped area, and then it closes it behind it so that it, it's not available for runoff. Obviously, if it doesn't run off, it's not going to cause problems downstream, and uh, uh, we're going to have better sugarcane crops. There's still plenty of good fishing spots in Louisiana, but we need to continue looking for the solutions to the problems facing our wetlands. There's something dangerous living in the waters of the Barataria Terrebonne Estuary in the wetlands along the Gulf Coast of Louisiana. It's something few people have actually seen. And some of those who have encountered the danger didn't live to tell about it. But it's not me. As you can see, our special effects budget isn't all we hoped for. Now, if the danger we're talking about was something as serious as a sea serpent, I'm sure we could have handled it by now. As a matter of fact, one of our great Louisiana chefs would probably have come up with a delicious sea serpent sauce pecan recipe. The problem is something too small even to see. Microscopic, in fact. We don't cook it up in a sauce piquant, but unfortunately, sometimes we do eat it, though we usually don't know about it until it's too late. The scientific name for this particular problem is pathogen contamination. Did I get that right? You nailed it, Chuck. Pathogens are tiny viruses and bacteria that occasionally make their way into the estuary and pollute the waters and contaminate the fish. And when we drink those polluted waters or eat that contaminated fish, we get sick. Cooking can kill some of the pathogens, but the problem is particularly bad with oysters since they're eaten raw. 
Now, since we can't walk around with a microscope all day examining every fish and oyster we eat, we have to turn to biologists to tell us where the pathogens are and how to deal with them. When we talk about potential contamination to the estuary, we have to talk about if this contamination is coming from sewage, which is a man-made type of contamination that could have bacteria and viruses from human sewage material, which we try to get an indication from using fecal coliforms, which is a type of bacteria that all warm-blooded uh, animals have in their intestine. If those are present, we know there could be pathogens present. This is something we can control by having better uh, sewage treatment techniques. On the other hand, there are a small group of people who are at risk for the normal marine bacteria that live in the ocean. These people have liver disease or perhaps have some other type of immunocompromising disease, and they have to be educated to be very careful in the saltwater areas where these bacteria, which belong to a group we call the Vibrio bacteria, are found. So we know all this stuff is in our water, but what can we do about it? Well, for one thing, we can make sure we properly dispose of human waste. And we all know what that is, don't we? We can make sure our sewage treatment systems are killing these pathogens before they get into the water. I guess that means our hunting and fishing camps have to have proper septic tanks too, right? Yep. In a recent study, nearly two-thirds of the sites sampled in the Barataria and Terrebonne basins showed a high level of these fecal coliform bacteria. This is largely due to untreated or improperly treated human waste being dumped into the water, the same water where we swim and harvest seafood. In this area, we have rather small lots. The soil is clay. Uh, the groundwater table is high. Therefore, septic tank and drain treads will not work. So we have the pollution of groundwater or the direct discharge into our streams, canals, and waters. A unique approach to the oyster contamination problem is the Oyster Irradiation Project. The project is based at Nickel State University, which is right in the middle of the estuary. The university is one of the sponsors of the show, so we had to get the name in somehow. Seriously, Chuck, this project is really important. Oysters are a good source of vitamins, minerals, and protein, and they also make up a large part of the Louisiana seafood harvest, so there are jobs at stake, too. At Nickel State University, we've been working with a process whereby we can eliminate the natural marine bacteria that can be a problem for individuals who have some type of immune disease using a process called ionizing irradiation. That sounds frightening, but in fact, it's nothing more serious than getting an x-ray. We essentially give the live oysters an x-ray. As the radiation passes through the oysters, it kills those bacteria. They're very easy to kill. It kills those bacteria, but leaves the oysters alive. This means that even those individuals who have an immune disease whereby they should not eat raw oysters would be able to eat these oysters safely. But improperly treated human waste isn't the only source of pathogen contamination. Another source comes from the beef, pork, and poultry industry. Well, let me guess, the cows and pigs and chickens aren't maintaining proper sewage treatment plants where they live? Sort of. See, when we keep a lot of animals in a small area, like a herd of cattle in a pasture, we end up with a lot of animal manure in that same small area. Like when you have a lot of people all living in one city. Yep. They have microbes in the manure, just like in human waste. And after a storm, the rainwater carries some of these virus and bacteria into the storm drains and canals, which eventually end up in the bayous and the bays. And then they get into the seafood, and if we eat the seafood... They get into us, and they make us sick. Of course, it only happens very rarely, but it does happen. Manure from uh, uh, cattle pasture areas, particularly in areas where there are concentrated feedlots, uh, that is where where cattle are concentrated uh, while feeding. Uh, sometimes hundreds uh, of cattle are, are in these particular areas and uh, produce uh, substantial amounts of manure, uh, which in turn can flow into our streams. Here in South Louisiana, we run a cow per every two acres of land, so naturally we do not have a concentration. Uh, we use the waste runoff from the cows as a natural fertilizer that regrows the grasses that the cows recycle, just a recycling of grass to manure, fertilizing and back to grasses. Oysters are one of the safest low-fat meat protein known to man. 
very safe for people to consume raw, except if you're in a small at-risk category with liver disease or you have an immune system deficiency. One of the concerns we have is beef, uh, poultry, pork producers. You know, we don't impact what they do and we sure don't want them impacting what we do. The oyster industry in South Louisiana produces about a hundred million dollar total economic impact. Of that, about 40% of the production comes from the Barataria Terrebonne area, which means that about $40 million a year comes from that area through shellfish production. Also about 10,000 jobs are dependent on the shellfish industry, which means that about 4,000 of those are dependent on the Barataria Terrebonne area, which is a very rich, exciting, and productive area for South Louisiana. It's not only living microorganisms that have contaminated some parts of the estuary, we also suffer from the presence of toxic substances in the aquatic environs. Translated into English, that's poisonous stuff that got into the water somehow. The toxins, or poisonous stuff, got into the water through a variety of sources, residential, industrial, and agricultural, and sometimes even through natural processes. We live in an area that Part of the major industry for us is the manufacture of chemicals and in an agricultural area. Both of those things are of concern to us because eventually they can be a factor in people's health. In addition, there are some everyday chemicals that are otherwise healthy and safe, but we, we misuse them in some ways. We might use chemicals in strengths that are too strong that eventually build up to a toxic level and then we poison ourselves or poison the environment. Well, bioaccumulation is the process of building up in higher, higher amounts or concentrations a chemical substance within the body of an individual animal. Now when that animal is eaten by a predator, those chemical substances are passed on to that predator and this is known as biological amplification of that chemical substance. Residential areas are one source of toxic contaminants. Sometimes people use pesticides or household chemicals inappropriately, and they may wind up in the waters and contaminate or kill the fish. And sometimes when people change their oil, they pour the used oil down storm drains. People really do that? Oh yeah, as unbelievable as it sounds. People also sometimes spray diesel fuel or gasoline on weeds to kill them, especially in hard to reach areas like this ditch. So the toxic chemical gets a head start. Right. The chemical's already in the ditch so that when the rain comes, it washes down the ditch, into the bayou, and then into the fish. And we know how that story ends. It might kill the fish. Or worse yet, it might not kill the fish, and then we eat the fish. People really do need to learn how to be more environmentally friendly. Another potential source of this problem could come from agriculture. You see, after the fields are sprayed with herbicides to control weeds and insecticides to control bugs, the rainwater might wash some of these chemicals into the canal and then into the bayou. And some of these chemicals might be toxic. And you know the rest of the story. The toxins might end up in the waters of the wetlands and harm the fish and shellfish. But there are people at work trying to solve this problem. The Louisiana sugar industry is very proud of the integrated pest management program we've had in place since the 1960s. This program utilizes trained personnel paid for by farmers, which monitor fields on a weekly basis and determine economic thresholds. This program also utilizes resistant varieties, uh, natural predators such as the imported fire ant, which attacks the insects we're trying to control, and a very careful use of insecticides. Using this program uh, over the last 20 years, we've been able to cut the number of insecticide applications uh, that we apply every year from an average of 12 to less than two applications per year. We feel, in addition to saving money to the farm on insecticide costs, this has greatly reduced the insecticide load in the environment and is a benefit to everybody concerned. Another source of toxic substances is from the oil and gas industry, which is Louisiana's biggest industry. When we drill into pockets of petroleum, we can also hit pockets of ancient seawater, which sometimes contain toxic substances. When this water comes up with the oil and gas, then we have a toxic substance to deal with. And you know how that story goes. Oil and gas discharges, as many people don't realize, are not mostly man-made chemicals, but really they're naturally occurring materials. Uh, they come up in conjunction with the production of oil and gas. Uh, they come up from reservoirs deep within the earth. 
Uh, much of the water is salt water, similar to salt water is found in the Gulf of Mexico. It's more saline than Gulf of Mexico waters in many cases, but it's salt water produced from uh, geologic reservoirs deep within the earth. But oil and gas discharges that we discharged today and in the past were permitted or authorized by the state. So we discharged at levels which were thought to be safe. Um, but accidents happen, and occasionally uh, some of the sources of toxics in our estuary were caused by accidents. Uh, the vast majority, I think, were permitted and authorized discharges, however. From a toxic standpoint, I think you'll find that the overall health of the Barataria Terrebonne Estuary is excellent. Uh, that's not to say that we don't have problems, but the problem areas we've identified are highly localized and contamination is minimal. That's good news, but the best news is that everyone is committed to reducing new sources of toxics in the estuary in the future. Sometimes toxic chemicals get into the water from chemical refineries and hazardous waste disposal sites situated on the edge of the estuary. The industrial sites you see here are located on the Mississippi River. As with all chemical plants, occasional spills and runoff occur, which means the chemicals can end up in the river. And when the river water goes into the bayou, it carries these chemicals down to our estuary. And some of those chemicals could be toxic, too. And you know how that story goes. Oh, uh, is that the one where the a woodman arrives just in time, cuts open the big bad wolf, pulls out the grandmother? Right and not. It's the one where thousands of fish could die from being heavily poisoned, or where some people could get sick from eating contaminated fish. Over the last seven years, no state in the Union has spent more to clean up its waters than Louisiana. The chemical industry in this state spends 25 cents out of every dollar on environmental improvements. And over that same period, discharges to the rivers of the state have been reduced by nearly 90 percent. That's progress, and it's going to continue. One thing we haven't discussed yet is how hazardous waste disposal sites sometimes contaminate the water. Well, I guess it's time for another demonstration. Let's go to the lab. Hold on. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, we are doing a laboratory demonstration on toxic substances. <clears throat> okay, say this fish bowl represents the entire estuary, and my fish jaws in there, he represents all the fish in the estuary. Say this rat poison here represents a toxic substance. Now, what would happen if some of this toxic substance got in with the fish? Chuck, no! But come on, but it's, no. it's for the sake of no. science. No! Okay, have it your way. But what are you going to do to demonstrate how toxic substances leach through the soil and get into the water? How about we do that clay model thing now? Okay, if you want to blow the rest of the special effects budget, go ahead. Here we have a body of water. Let's call it maybe Bayou Lafouche. And imagine this is the land beside the bayou. When people put hazardous waste into the soil, such as this used motor oil, or when some companies bury toxic waste, even if the chemicals enter the soil far from the water, they can be carried by underground aquifers. That's rainwater seeping in through the soil and flowing toward the bayous and canals, and the toxins contaminate the estuary. And you know how that story ends. But it doesn't have to end like that. Government and industry can find ways to do business together without harming the environment. An example of industry agency cooperation in this effort is a project that ju is just beginning. The EPA is sponsoring. It's called the Red Mud Project, and it's in cooperation with Kaiser Aluminum. Uh, every year, Kaiser ships many, many thousands of tons of soil from Jamaica into the U.S., and they extract aluminum from the soil, and they're left with a residue called red mud, or spent bauxite, that is... Uh, very rich in iron and that gives it a certain property that may make it valuable to build salt marsh and that's what we're testing to see whether it will support the growth of salt marsh plants and if it will and if it's safe if, if there are no toxic problems that will result from this this could be a win-win situation the the industry can get rid of this material that it's just stockpiling right now and the state can gain some salt marsh. The government is doing more and more. But the government can't do everything. There's plenty that we can do ourselves. Watching this program was a good start. It's important to educate yourself about the issues related to the estuary. We've touched on a few of those issues, but education is an ongoing thing. It's important that you learn all you can and support political candidates who hold the same views as you do. Write to your newspapers. 
uh, write to your, uh, the legislature, um, your congressman. Just continue to keep this uh, uh, in, the, in the front of everybody's minds and ideas. We have to all save our estuaries. You've got to develop a uh, philosophical approach to this, uh, whereby you want to save the wetlands, not for your own benefit, but, but for the benefit of everyone. This is our way of life. I just hate to see it go. That's really what makes me sad. I want my grandchildren and their children to be able to see the things that I saw and do the things that I did. It's a paradise. It was a paradise, and it can be if we save it. Let's get ready to rumble! Some of these issues are not simple, but fortunately there are a lot of people in government wrestling with them right now. There are two major concepts in coastal restoration that are critical for our state. The first is preservation and restoration of our barrier islands. The barrier islands are those islands that are out there protecting our coastline and keeping us from having further problems than we're having right now. The federal government is not nearly as intense about its dedication to Barry Island's restoration and preservation. State leaders, on the other hand, are very impressed with this, and we feel that this is one of the keys to protecting the coastline. It's going to be one of our jobs in the legislature to see that the federal government gets on board with us with this. The second thing is sediment diversion. This is the Bayou of Fourche, which is a former this tributary of the Mississippi River, and at one time was the Mississippi River. Bayou of Fourche and these other distributaries over the years carried the soil in which we're standing right now and created this great land which we call, this paradise actually, which we call South Louisiana. Without the sediment diversion, we'll be lost. There's controversy about doing this, largely because the water table will have to be brought up and there'll be some impact for some of the local population. We're just gonna have to overcome those political considerations and do the best we can because the price of not doing anything is gonna be to lose everything that we have now. Like I said, these issues can be pretty sticky, but luckily not everything is. There are a lot of things that we can all do to protect the environment, and they start at home. For instance, we can cut back on the amount of dangerous chemicals we dump into the environment. Let's see what Esme has under her sink. Check! Ah. These are harsh cleaning chemicals. You can avoid them by choosing more natural, less toxic ones, like this one, which is citrus-based. A lot of this stuff winds up in our water. Okay, I should not use the strong cleaning chemicals, but can we please get out of my cabinet? Yes. Really? Yes. Because we're going to the laundry room. No! Low phosphate detergent is a good start in the laundry room. But remember, only do laundry when you have a full load. That saves energy, detergent, and water. Let's check out what's in Esme's bathroom now. Chuck, I'm not kidding. Stay out of my bathroom. Okay. I'll stay out of your bathroom. Good. Told you. <laughs> Speaking of saving water, using low flow shower heads and faucets can also conserve water when we take showers and stuff. As we said earlier, it's important to recycle oil. You can bring used oil to any full service car care center. One quart of oil can contaminate up to 2,000 gallons of water. It's important to remember also to clean the oil drips from your carport. That oil can wind up in the water as well. When taking care of your lawn, there are a few things to remember. First, only use the amount of fertilizer you actually need. Excess fertilizer can wash away and wind up in the water. Also, when watering your lawn, try to use methods that don't waste water, such as soaker hoses or trickle irrigations. Remember, it's very important not to waste water. See, I just took a shower and did my laundry with only 12 ounces of water. It's taken me a long time to train Chuck, but it's never too early to start teaching children about conservation. Gail Diamond teaches her students at Audubon Elementary that the future begins with them. We must get off to an early start in education, teaching children about environmental science, ecology, conservation. We must begin in the primary years, in kindergarten, teaching an additional three R's. Those three R's are respect for their environment, responsibility in maintaining that environment, and resourcefulness in finding creative ways to solve existing problems and problems that may occur in the future. I think it's important 
teach the future generations to respect the wetlands. I think adults should care also because they help create this problem, so they need to help make a solution for it. If we don't take care of the wetlands, then we won't have any. Because if you don't learn about the wetlands right away, then the wetlands might be gone and you'll never learn about them. It's very important to learn about the wetlands because one day they might not be here. In our study of Louisiana wetlands, I've used three strategies. The first strategy is to use hands-on, inquiry-based learning, where the children get to experiment with environmental issues. Lots and lots and lots of wetland animals, I mean endangered animals, are in the wetlands. If we don't take care of the wetlands, our endangered species will be gone and we'll never be able to get them back. And then we'll be in big trouble. The other is technology. Technology plays a key role in the unit through use of the internet and also multimedia production, which includes field trips, a digital camera, and student productions of sound slide videos. We use the quick take camera to take pictures of things, and then when we got back, we put them on the computer, and we made a multimedia show with it. Going into the swamp was fun and seeing all of the animals, like snakes and nutria. We saw an alligator and we saw some birds and some turtles and it was really neat to see it. Our culminating activity for the unit usually centers around the visual and performing arts. Students love to draw illustrations, to do paintings, to make models to sing, to dance, to do dramatizations of the real life experiences that they have had in studying this unit. Well, I made this sort of turtle by uh, paper mache. We start up as just crumpling up newspaper and then getting strips of newspaper, dipping it in paper mache and wrapping it around it and trying to form it into the shape of a really turtle. And I was in the music group, and we did a song called Mr. Frog. I learned that all kinds of animals and different animals and different things live there, and I think it's really neat if you could just go out and study them. Her class is great. I'm very lucky to be in this class. If you're learning something and it's fun, you'll learn it much easier than you would just teachers standing around and telling you. And if you're doing something fun while learning, <laughs> You'll remember it better and obviously do well on tests. Education is very important. You can't correct a problem until you clearly understand that problem. And we have to make changes that everyone can live with. The Bear Terry Terrible National Estuary Program has made some recommendations intended to help fight the seven priority problems. What's been proposed thus far are the first 50 steps that, that need to be taken to preserve or restore the estuary. You know, people need to realize that it is much cheaper to address a problem as soon as it is identified as a problem rather than waiting until it gets to a critical nature. For instance, if you take the cost of preserving an acre of wetlands versus the cost of rebuilding that acre of wetlands once it's lost, it is much, much more expensive to rebuild it once it's lost. What we're trying to do is move forward in the future with identifying problems as they come up and address those problems at that stage. It's going to be much more uh, cost effective to do it that way. Uh, it will be much more effective also with solving the problems. People need to realize that uh, over time they need to continue to be involved. I would encourage everyone to, to be active as citizens, to be involved in the various citizens groups that are available. Uh, that will help address the problems that we all share and help determine the solutions that we all can move forward with to implement. So, if we're going to solve the problems facing our wetlands, everyone is going to have to get involved, the government, industry, and the public. And remember, the public means every individual. As we've seen, there are lots of things individuals can do to help keep Louisiana's wetlands and water clean and healthy. There are also major governmental projects like the Bear Terry Terrible National Estuary Program. The suggestions they've made have had a positive impact on our wetlands. Since our culture, our economy, and even our health are dependent on the wetlands, it's clear that vanishing wetlands lead to a vanishing future for Louisiana. 
So everyone is going to have to get involved. If we each do our own small part, together we can reverse the damage that has been done to the plants, animals, land, and the water of our coastal Louisiana estuary. We can start our own domino effect, but that starts with one person making a change. And that one person is you.